begin with the opening prayer. Grant, O God, that the worship we offer may be our channel for new, abundant life, not only hoped for, but worked for, through faithful word and deed. Amen. Opening hymn is on 327. Let's crown him with many crowns and 327. be seated. Our psalm will be found on page 844, and it's Psalm 121. Okay, so <laughs> there are two responses. Let's see. Or, no, there's three. Yikes. Let's go with the general response, I think. So response two. Oh, the first one? Okay, that will be fine. Okay, so we'll do response number one. <laughs> up my eyes to the hills, from whence does my help come? The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. 
The sun shall not smite you by day. The Lord will keep you from all evil, will keep your life. Prayer of Illumination is printed in the bulletin. And we'll read that together before the scripture readings. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our hearts, minds, and lives to the scripture message shared with us this morning. So our first reading comes from Genesis. We're no longer following Adam and Eve. Now we've moved on to Abraham. So, Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, From your country and your kindred, and your father's house, to the land that I will show you, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And then the Romans reading is from Romans chapter 4. We have 1 through 5, and we skip to 13 through 17. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but something due. But to the one without works, trust him who justifies the ungodly. Such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham nor his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be their heirs, Faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it also depends on faith, in order that the promises may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share in the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as was written, I've made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross on 301.
You may be seated. Our gospel reading comes from the book of John. I think we've been in Matthew for a while now. So check and see. Yes, we've been in Matthew for a while. So now we skip to John. We're here from chapter 3. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He was a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one can do these signs apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and the spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, then how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Okay, we're going to do some storytelling today. If I have some guys who want to come forward here, welcome to it. So I might do some drawing, so we'll see. I was supposed to bring a map with me, and I didn't bring a map. So we heard just a little bit from the story of Abraham, but we called him Abram today. The very first reading we did, the really short reading, was about a man named Abraham. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of his story, because he's a really unique guy, but we have to start with his ancestors. Do you guys know the story of Noah? That ring a bell. Very good. So, do you remember what Noah built? The ship. Yeah, Noah built what's called an ark. It was a big boat. So, Noah was commanded, build the boat. And what did he bring on to the boat? Animals. And how many of each kind? Two of each kind. And in some of the translations, he brings on more of some other things. (laughs) But it should be two of each kind. So Noah goes under the ship, he and his family are saved, all the animals are saved, and then they land again when the earth is dry, and then many years later, Abraham is a descendant of Noah. So I don't know how many great-grandfathers Noah is, but Abraham is in that line. And so Abraham, let's see if I can do a little bit of drawing. Okay, you guys know what Africa looks like, right? The continent of Africa. Okay, I'm going to draw that, a really bad drawing of it. (laughs) And then up here, okay, 
So there is Africa. <laughs> so in here, that's what they call the Near East. That's sort of where Jesus was. That's where Jesus came to. Up here is Turkey. And over here is Iran. And Ira or Iran's over here. Iraq is over here. So Abraham is from Iraq area. Abraham hears God's voice. And God tells him, Abraham, go to Canaan. So can you guess where Canaan would be? On my terrible map? <laughs> down. Yep. He has to go down and over. So he goes all the way down and over into here. So Abraham's called by God to go to a new land. But then when he gets there, there's bad news. It's really dry. There's no water. The food's not growing right. So they have to move on even further. So they go down into Africa for a little bit. And then they come back up when the drought is over. So Abraham is called from his country, sent to a place that's not, not quite right, goes down, lives for a little bit, comes back up. Throughout that whole time, he's with two people. He's with his nephew, whose name is Lot, and he's with his wife, whose name is Sarah. So the three of them travel for a little bit. And then they hit all sorts of problems. Pharaoh kind of takes Sarah, they kind of kidnap Sarah for a little bit. They get her back, but Pharaoh takes Sarah for a little bit. Lot and Abraham have to split up. They were fighting over land. They were fighting over where their cows went, which fields are theirs. So they had to split up. And then there's a bunch of wars going on. So this period, this whole time, there's a lot of fighting going on. So it's kind of, myster it's kind of mysterious why God would call Abraham all the way into all those troubles. But that's the first part of the story. So after they finally settled, the wars are over, they got Sarah back, Lot has his own land, everything is starting to settle, God talks to Abraham again. And this time he says, I want to reaffirm a covenant with you. And God tells Abraham, I will make you the father of many people, as numerous as the stars. So that's where we're going to end the story today, as God reaffirms his covenant with Abraham. He says, I will make you the father of many nations. So that's the story so far. And a lot of stuff happens next. So we won't even get into the Isaac story quite yet. <laughs> okay. I think that's it. Let's do a brief prayer here. God of all, you call us into strange places. We ask that when you call us, that we may be ready to go. That we may be willing to go into uncomfortable places because you have called us there. And from there, you will nurture us and care for us. May we each be as willing as Abraham to go to a new land. We thank you for the ways in which you nourish us and nurture us, even despite being a little uncomfortable at certain times. Thank you for your covenant and for your promise and reaffirming it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, thank you guys.
So when you're in church on a Sunday morning, like we are now, and you're in your usual seat, I predict that a lot of us have found a pew that you'd like to sit in, that's where we go. <laughs> you're listening to the pastor, or maybe you're listening to a reader that we have for that Sunday, and you start to think, deja vu. <laughs> start to think, we have already done this. Or maybe you have a least favorite part of the service. You think, I don't really want to read the creed again. <laughs> I don't really want to say the creed every week. I don't really want to sing this song again. We sang that two months ago. You start to wonder, why do we do this? Why do we meet over and over? Maybe some other times you're sitting in your pew and you hear something that's read from the New Testament and you start to get goosebumps on your arms. And you're almost like, I can viscerally feel the spirit moving around me. And you start to think, is this God? Because that reading could go on forever and I would not mind it. Somehow, it's easy for me to say, <laughs> But somehow I think we're in the middle of both. We know that we need to get together for worship. And it's the same familiar pattern kind of every week. We sort of like the pattern, some of us. And it's amazing that we can see God working through each and every time that we are here. We can see God working through our worship service. When you have that mindset, it kind of makes you wish the church was more often. Why do we just go once a week? If we like to gather together, and if we like to sing, and if we like to hear scriptures, why don't we go more often? The hope is that if we went more often, our lives would start to become spiritually transformed. The more often we went, the more that we heard, the more we listened, the more we'd see changes in our life and it would just flow on right out into the world. It'd start on a Sunday morning, then it'd be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday services, and Sunday services, and our world would slowly start to get transformed. So why doesn't that happen? My observation is, I think we quickly forget when something has changed our lives. So for an explanation, I got to meet my niece, for the first time a couple days ago. She's not a niece by blood relation, it's just my best friend from high school. Finally had a baby. And I was delighted to be able to see this happy three month old. I think that's the first time I've really held a baby for any extended period of time. <laughs> and it was really exciting. I finally got to meet this little child. And when talking with her mama, I realized the many months of pain, the sleepless nights, the tears, the worry, why isn't my child normal like the other children, all of that stress that she had for about the first month of that baby's existence in the world and kind of just faded away into the past. Now she is a happy three month old and life is pretty good. The body heals, the mind recovers. The baby grows. <laughs> and I praise God that moms and dads are so resilient because those first couple weeks were terrible seeming. <laughs> I think that as Christians, we're sort of like this too. We profess God through Jesus Christ. We hold on to this deep faith, this sense of rightness in the world. It's way deep down in our hearts where we almost can't even express it. And we can affirm that we're creations of God, that we're made to love, that we're made by love. And when we see modern miracles, when we see that the cancer is gone, we say, praise God. And then, just like that, it leaves our minds. <laughs> How quickly we forget something that is beyond ourselves. So when I was reading the John th 3 passage, I empathize with Nicodemus. 
He goes late in the night to Jesus. He goes late so nobody will really see him. And he says in a quiet voice, Lord, we know that you're of God. You're doing miracles that can only be done by God. But as soon as the people see it, it's like they forget. They justify away the miracles, or they file it away, refusing to just witness to the light that they had seen. And there is Jesus listening to Nicodemus. I can just picture him in his mind thinking, you're so close, Nicodemus. You're so close to a breakthrough. And he tells him, you know that I'm of God. You know this. But unless you have faith, that law and the spirit, unless you have all three combined, you won't really get far. You can't just get by on just the law. Jesus says, right now, faith is in front of you. Jesus is like, right now, you see me physically. You've seen it, so now believe. So it reminds us that each and every one of us has seen the spirit moving. We've seen it in the world around us. So how can we forget? (laughs) How can we file miracles away? My theory is, I'm philosophizing from the pulpit again, but it's how brains preserve themselves. I think if we truly let the spirit work, if we truly try and process about the absolute humbling wonder that it is that Jesus came in flesh, I don't think we could ever stop talking about it. I think if we could truly process, if we could truly wrap our minds around it, our whole lives would just be crazy talking about how amazing God is. I sort of think of the people that Jesus healed. He healed so many people. But a few of them said, Lord, we're going to follow you now. You've healed us. We want to follow you. And Jesus says, no, no. He says, go back to your villages. Tell your villages that this happened. Jesus wants them to spread the word rather than just to follow him. So why is the law there? If Jesus came, why is the law there? And I think the law is there because our minds can grasp it. Our minds can kind of wrap ourselves around it. We say the Ten Commandments are there so that we have a bare bones moral compass. Jesus fulfills the law, but the the law is still there, it's just fulfilled. I'd like to think that we'd still have inclinations not to betray any of the Ten Commandments, even without them being written down. I still think we would know right from wrong. And the Spirit's guidance, the Spirit's guidance is beyond description. Jesus does the best example that he can. He talks about the wind in this passage. He says, you can see how it moves other people, you can see it moving objects, but we can't really predict where it comes from and where it goes off to. Jesus himself changes some things because he is a physical reminder. The law became enfleshed. The spirit became enfleshed. God became enfleshed. And Christ has a relationship with the Holy Spirit that we don't have. Christ was able to cast, send the Holy Spirit as well as receive. Jesus was baptized as well as commanding the spirit. The best we can do is to be baptized. We can't tell the spirit where to go. We can just be baptized and let the spirit into us. But when we have a strong faith, we're able to ask things from God that will be granted. So I have to ask, have you ever had a prayer answered? Probably, we should have some head nodding. You've probably had a prayer answered that you've asked God about. So when I look at this, We can't take that lightly. I know that our bodies work to heal themselves. If you get paper cuts on your fingers, they heal up. If your cat gets you frequently, (laughs) the wounds heal up. Sometimes our bodies work so we don't remember some of the things that have happened to us, for better or for worse. But I think that we should be a little bit better about exclaiming, telling other people when the Spirit works in our lives. I personally do believe in chance. I do believe in coincidences. 
but I also know that there are many things that we chalk up to being a coincidence that might not be. I was at a clergy gathering this past Thursday, and I heard a story from one of the pastors that retired recently. She retired in December, and usually pastors retire in June. She retired suddenly. And she did not know who would fill her shoes at her church. That same month, right around the same day, a pastor in a completely different state felt a call from God to move up to northern New York and to fill one of our churches up here. And there he is at her church. I'm not sure that's a coincidence. <laughs> Our new bishop, who I met this past Thursday, has come to northern New York at a time such as now, one year, one year from a very monumental vote. And let me assure you, he is the man for this job. So unless we can see God working, unless we can point that out and say, that's not coincidence, that's the spirit, and describe that to other people, and remember this for future generations, proclaim it to future generations to come, we may start to feel that our relationship with God is stale. Unless we can see it and proclaim it, we may feel that our relationship with God is kind of stale. The days of doubt will begin to feel stronger. Some days where you want to doubt even the existence of a God at all, more of those days will come to you. So for a group of people, Christians, us, who have claimed God has changed our lives, we have claimed that the Spirit moves and we've seen it, I think we can do better. What holds us back from living as if the Spirit has come upon you? I encourage us that maybe we shouldn't be as discerning as we might feel that we need to be when sharing your faith with other people. And I know the world works very hard to discourage those from speaking about their faith these days. Sometimes if you let other people know you're a Christian and you go to church, you might get weird looks or you'll have people laugh and say, why do you believe that? Why do you believe in a sky daddy? <laughs> That's terms that I've heard before. <laughs> I know having faith isn't popular these days. But the words that we will be sharing, our faith journey, our testimonies, they're borrowed words. They're not just coming from us, they're borrowed. These words are deeper than our very beings. So as we continue through Lent, we're still in these 40 days. I'm curious how your Lent has been going, if you've given up anything, how is your fasting going? But I'll ask that another time. <laughs> Let us see where we can sing God's praises. Where have we seen the Spirit working? And where can we share that good news? Where can we affirm the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit, that was completely the Holy Spirit moment, and then not let it go, not let it go past our brains again? For if we truly believe in Jesus Christ, then we have everything. Okay. That's what I have for us today. I'm going to have us um, respond to the sermon by reciting a creed that has been said for hundreds of years from Christians all around the world, found on page 881, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, Forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Okay, we're going to move into a time of offering. I invite my usher to come forward.
O Lord, you who have given us the season of Lent, the season for prayer and fasting and almsgiving, accept these, our gifts, at this time. May they be used in whichever way you see fit. Amen. Okay. It is a communion Sunday, but we're cutting it close here. So we'll do the, the shorter version, which is found on page 12. Oh, 13. We'll start with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Father, power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of God and the glory forever. Amen. I invite my ushers forward at this time.
the blood of Christ shed for you. We'll turn to the prayers of the people, as printed in our bulletin. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world. All work for justice, freedom, and peace for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, defend us, and the people, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth, for Bishop Hector, E.S. Whedon, and all bishops and other ministers, all who serve God in this church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, that your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Our closing hymn will be, I Know Whom I Have Believed, and 714.
Our closing prayer is printed in the bulletin. God of wilderness and water, your son was baptized and tempted as we are. Guide us through this season that we may not avoid struggle, but open ourselves to blessing. Through the cleansing depths of repentance and the heaven-rending words of the Spirit. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. <laughs>